Welcome. Glad glad to have you here this morning. Um, just a few announcements as we as we begin. Make sure you have a, a bulletin with you. If you don't, there are uh, others and extras out in the hallway there. Uh, in your bulletin, you've got a welcome slip. If you don't have a welcome slip, we did run short this morning. Um, just raise your raise your hand now if you don't have a welcome slip and need and and need one. Um, because you know if we've got families here that have like you know, need one for the five of them, that kind of thing. Okay, all set? All right. Um, what you can do is fill in, uh, fill in this welcome slip here, especially if you haven't filled in one of these before. And you can put as, as much or as little, little information as you want there uh, for me. I am the only one that sees the information on these uh, slips. Uh, and if you'd like to uh, give me an email address or something like that, I'd love to send you a note home just saying thank you for, thank you for coming. Uh, there's a section on the back if you're here for the first time called for our visitors there with some boxes to check if any of those are fitting for you. And uh, then at the bottom here is a section marked for all. And if you have anything you need to let me know, uh, you can let me know there. Um, if you have prayer requests, I'd be glad to be praying for you and your concerns uh, during the week this week. So you can put those requests there, especially if you have people who are in need of knowing Christ um, I'd be glad to be praying for them, for God to bring them uh, faith uh, during this, not that faith, but faith. Um, I just happened to be looking at faith when I said that word. Um, uh, but uh, put their names there, and I'd love to be praying for them. If you'd like our elders to know and be praying, there's a box you can check that lets me know it's okay to tell them. If you'd like our members to know, there's a box at the very bottom. Uh, that uh, says that's uh, for me to do. And so I send out an email to our, our members uh, each uh, Sunday afternoon, letting them know things they can pray for during the week. And so um, when you've filled out that, uh, you can just fold it in half and just set it on the floor underneath your chair. And uh, one of the deacons or deacon assistants will uh, uh, pick those up and get them to me after the, after the service. Um, Numbers of things out on the the welcome table there that you can grab. All that stuff is all that stuff is uh, free except for the bottle of sanitizer. Don't take that away. We need it, um, but you can use that. Um, and we have gathered here this morning. Um, gathered here this morning for worship. Um, let's take a look this morning before we begin. Um, at uh, open up to the Psalms there in, in your Bible or in the Bibles in your seats, the Psalm 46, and I'll have a page number for you in just a in just a second. 403. So page 403 in the Bibles that are in the seats, um, and that's a, the Bibles in the seats are the, the 1984 NIVs, and so we're going to read this together out loud. And so if you have a different translation. And they go ahead and, and grab one of the Bibles in the seats so that you're um, reading the same words uh, with us. Great passage to focus our minds as we begin worship this morning. Psalm 46, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read all, all of us together in unison are going to read down through this psalm. Let's begin. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth, he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. 
I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Please use now this time of silent preparation to prepare your hearts and minds to focus upon the Lord and to give him worship. Good morning, everyone. Our call to worship this morning is in song. Uh, Please stand and we'll sing, I greet thee, whom I sure redeem our heart. Declaration of the Gospel this morning comes from Titus, chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. We also worship God by confessing our sins in prayer. Uh, I'll lead us in prayer and give give you all time for silent prayer from your seats. Pray with me. Father, we, we are a sinless people. We, we fail to love you with all of our hearts and minds. We fail to love our neighbors perfectly as you have loved us and as your son has loved us. Through his journey and, and sinless life on this earth, he was a willing and adequate sacrifice for all of our sins. And we thank him for that. And because of it, because we are forgiven, we can come to you and confess our sins freely. And we come to you now from the silence of our seats to do that.
Father, thank you for hearing our confessions of our sins through your Son. Thank you for the forgiveness that we have and strengthen us in the way that we worship, in the ways that we read your word, and from these sermons that we would repent from these sins and follow you more closely and love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. We worship God by confessing our faith. We'll do that responsibly. It comes to us this morning from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, it's chapters chapter 17, 1 and 3. And this is about the perseverance of saints. What does the Bible teach about the certainty of the salvation of true Christians and their faithfulness? Whom God has accepted in his Son, effectually called, and sanctified by his Spirit, can we fully or finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein, and be eternally saved. Nevertheless, they may be the temptations of Satan and the world, the prevalency of corruption and remaining in them, and neglect of the means of their persecution, fall into grievous sins, and, for a time, continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts. For their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. We worship God also by giving of our tithes and offerings. We still are not passing the plate. Please continue to send your tithes and offerings via the P.O. box on the bulletin there. Let's pray. Father God, you are eager to bless us, and you do this constantly. You provide for us, provide joys and comfort and mercy. You provide substance to us, and you have provided for a king for us in Jesus. You are completely generous, completely faithful, and a perfect provider. Thank you for this. Please accept our tithes and offerings as our first fruits offered back to you and to your church, that your church may grow grow in size, grow in faith, grow in numbers who have um, come to believe in you and have increased your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And please rise and sing the Deathology. We were talking in Sunday school this morning about how uh, extensively our prayers are, are worshipped. And uh, in the heavenly uh, places in heaven, um, when Scripture describes heaven, what we usually see there is a throne room. And we're told in the book of Hebrews that Jesus has entered that throne room. And uh, he is there at the right hand of the Father. And uh, he is always living to intercede for us. And, and so we give our prayers to the Lord, uh, our great King and our great High Priest. Uh, we pray to the Father and have our prayers uh, interceded for uh, by, by Jesus as we pray in His name. Uh, we'll begin with the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us to pray, and then we'll continue on with uh, the prayers of our uh, concerns and, and thanks. So what are those things for which we can be praying this morning? Yeah, Joyce.
we'll give thanks to the Lord for his goodness to us and, and uh, um, uh, his, his goodness in, in teaching us, providing for us, um, so that when hard times come to us, he, he makes sure we're okay. And uh, one of the ways he does that is through his people. And uh, so we'll give thanks um, uh, uh, for him doing that and acting in that way for, um, for all the Pattersons. And, and, and thanks, of course, for him uh, receiving Alan to himself uh, a week ago. Yeah, Matthew. Have you been causing that, man? <laughs> In the middle of the night. It doesn't, but we understand what you're trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll pray for uh, pray for Jim and give thanks that uh, he's well enough to be heading back home this morning and pray for his continued uh, healing. We'll pray for uh, Charlene and her healing and her getting through physical therapy, uh, both with her, her hand and, and her neck. Yeah, Randy. We'll pray for the salvation of Laura's parents and, and uh, Laura's sister and Laura's sister's family. Yeah, Mike. Um, Reagan's got a surgery tomorrow okay. to correct the issues to be doing the surgery to see what they're finding. Okay. Um, his brother called him a while to be there, but I was um, just my prayers to God and to Reagan's mom that you're not there tonight. Lord, We'll pray for um, Reagan's dad, Frank, and for her mom as uh, Frank goes for surgery. We'll pray for, uh, that that surgery would be successful and um, take care of the issues that he's been having. And we'll pray for Reagan's mom as she uh, is there alone um, helping with that. Yeah, Kirk. That's what did it. Yeah. Okay, we'll pray for Kirk's uh, younger sister, Laura. She has COVID, and her three-month-old does as well. And they've just moved, and uh, her husband and is away right now. So we'll pray, for, we'll pray for them, for healing for them, and that they're able to get along okay during, during this until they're better again. Yeah, Emily. We're thankful for you. It's great to have you, have you here. But we'll give thanks. The Lord uh, does a lot of good work through getting us together. Yeah, Jim.
we'll pray for Christina's dad and Bob and his health and for Christina's sisters and for his care there. We'll pray that God would protect Ethan and Izzy. Um, we'll pray for salvation for uh, West Grand Cape. Yeah, David. Wait, I wrote down four. There's a fifth. Okay, you tell me who I'm missing. Leon, Cat, Sammy, and Esteban. Who did I miss? River. That's right. Great. We'll pray for their salvation. Yeah, Laura. Thanks. Sorry. Um, we'll pray for patience for Sierra and for healing uh, there as well. In my running, that's I'm, I'm always dealing with that. It's like I, I can't train too hard or I get injured and then I have to sit out for three weeks or so and then I have to rebuild up. It's awful. So sorry. Sorry that's going on. Allison. Pray for the salvation of Allison's friends. Yeah, Carl. We'll pray for Carl and Linda's uh, daughter, Michelle, and for endurance um, uh, emotionally and physically for her as she does her work with kids in public school. We'll pray also for our, our teachers, many of us among here, um, and your endurance in that and just the strain things are. We were just talking in our session meeting yesterday about, you know, what, what a different world it was. You know, a troublemaker when we were in elementary school is just like the model student. <laughs> it, it's really a different world and, and where that strain on that comes is, is with the teachers and administrators um, and, and a different mindset of parents um, you know, <laughs> you're the bad guy if you're the teacher who reports a kid who's been bad uh, and it used to be you would yeah. <laughs> I threw, a little, I threw a little carrot in first grade at somebody who said something to me I didn't like at the, the at lunch, and I got uh, reprimanded by the lunch lady, then by my teacher, and then by my parents who came back from open house two nights later <laughs> for doing that. I was the bad guy because I threw a carrot, and I was the bad guy for throwing a carrot. But my parents didn't defend me. My teacher didn't defend me because I had thrown a carrot. Um, and teachers don't have that luxury now of having um, all the adults support them in, in the, the raising and, and good disciplining of their kids. So we'll pray for, pray for that. Yeah, Matt. Sounds like lucky and king of the hill, right? 
Yeah, okay. We'll pray for uh, focus for uh, Matt's mom and, and knowing what's next and, and for her uh, finding that in Christ in the church. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we'll pray for um, various neighbors of ours. Um, no, I'm a pastor, and that's here I have invited, and, and um, uh, feel free to, um, as we pray for the salvation of uh, individuals silently during this prayer, to uh, include those people in your prayers too. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, Steve. Okay. 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 We'll pray for Crystal's brother Ray um, with COVID and that God would bring him through that. All right, let's get to the Lord in prayer. We'll begin with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Father, yours is the kingdom, and you have given that to your Son, and he reigns over us from your right hand in heaven, and we are glad for that. The good, perfect, sinless Son of David, who loves us, who's good, who cares for us, who shepherds us, leads and guides us in life, and protects us. Uh, Father, cause us to revere you, to revere your Son all the more because these things, because these things are true. We are grateful that you are in heaven above, uh, watching over us, knowing all things, uh, protecting us, providing for us. Uh, cause us indeed to revere and hallow you in your name. We pray for your Son's kingdom to, to come. We look forward to that day when we will uh, see your son face to face and be with you. Uh, we look forward to uh, that day when he will come again. Uh, until that time, uh, Father, uh, would your will be done here on earth as it's being done in heaven by us. Um, would you cause us to emulate uh, your uh, people who have who are with you in soul now uh, and who have... Um, uh, been doing your will perfectly uh, since you have made them uh, holy uh, upon their deaths. Uh, we pray that you would cause us to be more like them as they are like you. Uh, cause us to be, as Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So enable us to walk in your ways, um, to follow your commands, knowing that your commands come out of your great concern and love for us to guide and direct us in a way that we'll be blessed. Uh, we pray, Lord, for more people to come to know uh, your Son, uh, to come to saving faith and a repentance uh, over their sins and, and lack of attention to you uh, with that uh, attending a desire to live for you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would um, be bringing people to faith through our church uh, through our relationships with people who are out of town or family members, those kind of things. We pray specifically that you bring faith uh, to uh, Tom and Kathy Dow, uh, to Carrie and Vinny and Maddie and Ainsley and Colin, Laura's family, uh, to the grandkids of the, of the West, Brianna, Ethan, and Lexi, uh, Izzy, Lily, Josie, Ellie, and Gus, and their great-grandchild, Jordan. We pray, Lord, that you'd be bringing faith there. We pray that you bring faith to um, Allison's friends, Casey, Kelly, Nicole, Raleigh, Andrea, Tiffany, Christian, Kyle, and the Gibsons. We pray that you bring faith to David's friends, Leon, Kat, Sammy, Esteban, and River. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you'd be bringing uh, faith to 
uh, our neighbors and uh, that you'd bring them uh, to uh, church to hear of your son. And uh, Lord, all of us have those kind of people in our lives, neighbors and co-workers and, and relatives who don't have faith in your son yet. And so hear us now as we bring their names to you silently and ask of you to bring to them uh, the gospel and your spirit that they would believe in your son and be saved. Hear us now. Father, your mercy is evident by the fact that we're here. As as, uh, Jim read for us this morning, you saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of your mercy. You saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So thank you for doing that for us. We ask that you would do that in the lives of many of these people that we've named uh, to you now. We thank you that you care too for us in our Uh, humble state of physical life here on the earth in the midst of lots of sin, our own and the sins of others, Um, of broken bodies and broken relationships and and, uh, all the frailties that we experience. In the midst of that, Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for uh, placing us in the church. We thank you along with Joyce and, and her family for the goodness that you've shown to them. Uh, through the care and love of your people for them. Um, We thank you, Father, that you have brought Alan to yourself, though we're very sad about that. Um, Thank you for the comfort that you have provided for us, and we pray that you continue that uh, for Joyce and and for Anne and for Faith and for Jennifer and for David um, and all of us who loved loved Alan. Uh, We Thank you, Lord, for how it's an encouragement for us as we enter here on Sunday mornings and as Emily expressed this morning. Thank you for our church. Uh, Thank you that your truth from the Bible and your spirit has tempered the way we interact with each other and the way we really, truly, sincerely care uh, for each other. That's your work over and against uh, our sin natures and changing us, making us more like your son. We pray that you'd continue to do that. We pray, Father, that you'd provide uh, healing for Sierra's foot and patience for her as she has to sit out, especially missing some things she'd really like to be doing. We pray that you'd bring healing to uh, Crystal's brother, Ray, and that you'd protect him in the midst of his uh, contracting COVID and that you'd uh, get him through this. Uh, We pray that you'd bring uh, healing to Jim, and we're glad that you've made him okay and and enabled him to be able to see the doctors he needed to in the emergency room. Uh, Grant him a good sleep as he gets back um, uh, back home and can rest now and and healing. We pray that you bring healing to Charlene for her hand and and her neck. We pray that you use the physical therapy she's going through for those things um, to bring healing to her. We pray for Reagan's dad, Frank, Uh, that should cause his surgery tomorrow to be a great success, give skill and precision to the hands of those doctors or that doctor who's doing the surgery, and give comfort uh, to Reagan's mom as she's there uh, with her husband. We pray that you cause the surgery to have a great effect um, and bring uh, better health uh, to Reagan's dad. Uh, We pray, uh, Father, for Kirk's sister, Laura, and Laura's daughter, child, uh, three months old. Uh, We pray that you'd heal them of COVID 
uh, and uh, enable them to get along, especially with Laura's husband being out of town right now. We pray, uh, Father, for um, Christina's dad, Bob, for his health and for his care. We pray that you give wisdom to uh, Christina's sister and to her as they uh, look to how it can best be cared for. We, uh, we ask that you would protect uh, Ethan and Izzy um, from the, the decisions of their unbelief. And we pray, Lord, as uh, that you would bring faith to them, that they would look to you and to look to people around them who know what they're doing, like their grandparents, as they make decisions in life. We pray, Father, for uh, the Morris's daughter, Michelle, and for all our teachers and teacher assistants. We pray that you'd give them strength and endurance, um, the thick skin where they need thick skin, we pray that you would provide for them um, support from uh, parents and administrators. Uh, we pray that you'd cause their kids to behave um, and to cause their efforts to, to go for good uh, in those kids' lives and in their learning. We pray, Father, for uh, Matt's mom as well. As uh, Some plans have fallen through. We pray that you would uh, give her wisdom in what's next. We pray that you would uh, bring her into the church, uh, into a Bible-believing church. We pray that you would um, work in her heart and mind, that she would see that the solution she's missing, uh, the satisfaction that's not there, is to be found in you. For that's the case for everybody. Help her to see that. Help her to see that now. We thank you, Father, for your care for us as a church. We thank you that you lead us by your word. And we ask that this week, as temptations come to us, that you would deliver us from that evil, that you would cause us to see that your will, that your commands are always the way to blessing, and that departing from them brings us grief and sadness. We pray this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I, too much, yeah, too much information, but I just got new hearing aids, and so I can actually hear myself. The, the really bad news is I can hear myself sing, so <laughs> that part's no good. But let me know if I get too, too soft. Uh, we worship God uh, by listening to Him speak today. Uh, it comes from... Um, Preparing, the preparing for God's Word comes from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 2. We'll read this in unison. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, review, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Our first epistle reading comes from Romans, chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. That'll, you'll find that on page 799 in the Blue Bibles. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 11. In the same way, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil, its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, 
which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that, through you, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Our next epistle reading comes from Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. That's on page 852 of your Blue Bibles. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. I invite you to turn now in your Bibles to 1 Kings 9. Uh, we'll be looking again primarily at verses uh, four through uh, four through nine, but we'll start in verse one uh, to give us the context, which is that Solomon has just built the temple, and then he's uh, dedicated the temple uh, with a, a long prayer asking for God's blessing and and his using of the temple and his um, restoring the people uh, should they sin. So we begin in 1 Kings chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Uh, This is God's word, eternally true. When Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and had achieved all he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time, as he had had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I I have consecrated this temple which you have built, by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But... If you or your sons turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And though this temple is now imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of Egypt, and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. Here ends our reading. A response of thankfulness is printed for us um, in your uh, bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful uh, to you uh, that you've given us your word. You have not just saved us through the cross of Jesus, through his death in which he bore our sins, but you have given us your word to guide and direct us so that we don't have to live as, as fools, but can live with wisdom Uh, in this world of sin, sin that is our own and sin that is others. We pray that you would make us wise by your word, that you would cause us to know your commands and your truth, 
that you would help us to understand the good news of Jesus more deeply from what is preached today, uh, from this your word that you inspired by your spirit long ago. And by your spirit, grant our hearts understanding. Jesus preached to us from this your word which we've read, that we would grow to be more like Father, your Son, Jesus, and might bring you more glory on this earth. We pray, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. I've, uh, you know, I have five girls, and so I learned things that I never knew growing up. Uh, we had a, a, a male-centered home, and, and uh, my mom and my sister, but but uh, my brother and I and my dad, my dad was a good leader and, and, um, and things were just very male. But also we didn't have certain things back in the 70s when I was, when I was growing up. And one of those things is certain kinds of uh, crazy hair color. And, and so, you know, now, you know, the, the, the things about, um, you know, which was early in the 70s, Marge having blue hair is no longer a cartoon. Um, and, <laughs> And so, but one one thing I've learned is that there's there's permanent hair dye, um, and then there's hair dye that kind of fades, and, and you can buy that, and and you know it it starts fading, it's bright, and then starts fading, and then there's like a renewal to it, as well. So you can keep your hair or parts of your hair or whatever. I was at something in NC State last night that Tess was in, and and it was a a rainbow of different kind of hair at different kinds of places on different parts of the head and all that kind of thing. And uh, there's no uh, sin or not sin in any of those things. But, but sometimes I've, I've learned with this, there's, there's dye that, that, that fades. It doesn't just grow out. It starts fading. And, and you need more dye to, to brighten it up again. Um, this passage, as we've looked at it now, parts of it, three, three weeks now, and this will be the last, uh, talks to us about something else that can fade normally without attention to it. And that's our faith. Um, we don't have to pretend as Christians that faith doesn't fade in people. The Old Testament is a testimony of how faith fades in people. Um, the Old Testament, why are they in exile? Because their faith faded. And that's where we are here in 1 Kings. The people reading this text, this text was created in exile. God's people were in, were in Babylon because their faith had faded. So this gospel exhortation I've titled Preventing My Natural Fading from Faith or from Strong Faith. So, um, you know, that... It, it, the Gospel of Mark has been called a long introduction to a brief passion narrative <laughs> uh, by some scholars. You, you, the, the passion narrative that is Jesus going to Jerusalem, that's the main thing of the Gospel of Mark. And so sometimes scholars consider all that comes before it in Mark's Gospel to be an introduction. Well, this sermon is kind of that. It has a very long introduction to set things up. And then it has a slightly uh, shorter first point and then a very short second point. Uh, but the introduction is about life. That's why I put that there. <laughs> what is life for the Christian? Well, a number of things. And you see we've got a good number of things in our introduction. Don't worry about that. Um, the introduction is not uh, a percentage of the bigger points. It's bigger than the points. Um, but A, first thing in life. God wants us to know, and he shows us here, and he shows us throughout Scripture, that faithfulness, that's your blank, faithfulness to God results in blessing. Faithfulness to God results in blessing. And, and we see that here in this passage. God tells this will be the case uh, for David at verse 4. As for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness, that is if you'll be faithful. That will result in blessing for you. You and your sons will always have a king on the throne here in Jerusalem. And we can see this in places like Deuteronomy 28, where God lists the blessings and the cursings for his people. It's also in Leviticus 26, basically the same list of blessings and cursings for his people. And, and this is not uh, talking about justification or salvation. Okay? 
Justification is not by works. Salvation is not by what you do or don't do. This is God as your father who has you as his kid, and you'll always be his kid. You have his DNA. There's no way you'll never be his kid. Teaching you how to live as a person so that your life has blessing because he cares for you. Um, this is God, as, and that's what we're talking about if you like theology. This is sanctification. We're in the realm of sanctification here. And God says to his people who is rescued out of Egypt, he gives them his word at Sinai. Okay, we always want to see that, that representation in the Old Testament. God doesn't give him the Ten Commandments and his word in Egypt and say, if you obey this well enough, I will rescue you out of Egypt. No, he rescues a complaining, whining, abusing of Moses' people out of Egypt who bring foreign gods out of Egypt into the wilderness that they have to get rid of once they get into the wilderness. He brings this complaining, whining, complaining, whining sinful people out. He saves them, and that's us. And what does he do for his saved people? He gives them his word because he cares for them. At Sinai, it's after they've been baptized through the Red Sea, 1 Corinthians 10, that he gives them his word and directs and, and he guides them. And so this is, this is the idea here, that faithfulness to God results in blessing. Just like when you're growing up as a, as a kid, if you obey your mom or your dad, you, you, know, you get your treat. Um, and if you don't, hopefully you don't. Um, James 1.5, or James 1.25, uh, talks about us looking at God's word, and if we go away and forget who it describes we're to be, it's like a person who looks in the mirror and then forgets what he looked like a second later. You know, like the word of God describes who we're to be, who we are, who God is destined for us to be as, as followers in him. But when we do his word, James 1.25 says, we are blessed in the doing of it. And we all know that experience as Christians. When we obey the Lord, when we follow his commandments, especially when it's difficult and we follow it, we know the satisfaction our souls feel and experience. We're blessed in the doing of it. Second thing, B. So faithfulness to God results in blessing. Unfaithfulness, and this is talking to Christians, unfaithfulness for us as Christians results in fatherly discipline. So verse 7 here, um, if um, you do not observe, verse 6, if you do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you, that's a plural you there. Um, if the translators were Southern, they would have written y'all. Um, I've given you and you go off and serve other gods and worship them, then I'll discipline you. I will cut you off from Israel. It's not that you won't be my people anymore but I'll discipline you. I'll cut you off from Israel, from the, cut off Israel from the land. I have given them and will reject this temple I've consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among the peoples. So unfaithfulness results in fatherly discipline. The writer of Hebrews talks about this in Hebrews chapter 12. He says, what father who loves his kids doesn't discipline them? Uh, what father who sees his kid uh, his four-year-old run across the busy street and make it to the other side, doesn't tell his kid, never do that again. Or when you do that, you have to look left and right. Or since you're four, really, you need to be holding the hand of your mother or me. And you need to wait on the sidewalk before you cross the street until you're holding our hand. What loving father would not tell his kid this? And so God is the same. He's a loving father who disciplines us out of love when we are unfaithful. And we see that here in this passage. C, C, also, we are not robots. We're not robots of spiritual faithfulness. We are not robots of spiritual faithfulness. So we see this in, in verse six. Um, it's possible, you know, I know it's a big surprise for you. It's possible that we do not observe the commands and decrees that God has given us. I know it's not, no, it's true for you. It's true for me too. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, robots of spiritual faithfulness. R verse 9, um, we are people who can forsake the Lord our God 
and embrace other gods, worshiping and serving them, and have disaster come upon us in the Lord's discipline. Or James 4, 7, we're told, is just one of many, I mean, thousands of places you can go in Scripture. We have to be told, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Why would God say this if it's not automatic? Right? God tells us, no, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Uh, we, we're, we're constant. It's not automatic that we're faithful and we need to understand this as Christian people. Just because we are Christians does not mean we will be without sins. Uh, John's point in 1 John is anyone who says he does not have sin is not a Christian. He's living in fantasy land. Um, that's a back to school reference for any of you who know that. Um, D. Uh, D. Because of this, um, because we're not robots of spiritual faithfulness, um, or, or, sorry, this is because, not because of this, this is because while we as believers have the Spirit of God always present within us, we also still have sin natures. So on the one hand, we have 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19, and the end of uh, Ephesians 2, which tells us the Spirit of God dwells in us. But also, Romans 6 and 7, and, and Jim read for us this morning, some from Romans 6, that says, we were slaves to sin, and then we continue to struggle with temptations because we still have a sin nature. So in this life as Christians, you have the Spirit of God as a Christian in you, and you still have a sin nature. That is this urge to do wrong, this urge to rebel against God, this urge to have other gods or to follow other things, to bow down to them and to worship them instead of doing what God says to do. Um, this is pre We have an interior struggle going on. Uh, Jim didn't read to us from Romans 7, but if you're familiar with Romans 7, Paul says, I do what I don't want to do. I know what's right, and I want to do that, but I don't do it. Woe is me. Who can understand? It's crazy living inside me. And that's the case for all of us. There's this interior struggle going on. We have sin natures, and so because of this, E, because of this, because we still have a sin nature, and just will last thing on that, you know, the glory of our death, the glory of Jesus coming back is what we've learned in our one of our catechism questions, one of our catechism songs. The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness. When we die, or when Jesus comes back, whichever comes first for each of us, our sin natures are taken away. No longer does temptation have any effect on us. But that's not true today. We have a sin nature, and so we're instructed by Titus, for instance, to say no to ungodliness, because we can say yes, and sometimes we do. So E there, because of this, because we still have a sin nature, fading away, that's your blank, away. Fading away from God is something often seen. Again, verses 6 and 9. This is almost predicted. God says, if you do this, if you do that, then this will happen. If you go after other gods, if you forget my commands and decrees, then I'll expel you from the land. I'll exile you. Imagine if you're reading 1 Kings, you're one of the original readers of it, and you're in exile. You're saying, yep, this is what happened to us. God did expel us from the land because we didn't pay attention to his decrees and laws, and we did go after other gods. Um, it's always been interesting to me, um, Moses in, in his farewell speech in Deuteronomy 31, 29. He's just given the law a second time. Um, it's, it's to those who were uh, under 20 when they came out of Egypt, and they're about to go into um, the promised land under Joshua. And here's what he says to them. His pep speech, so to speak. You'll see why I'm laughing in a second. Deuteronomy 31, 29. For I know that after my death, this is Moses speaking, I know that after my death you are sure to become utterly corrupt. <laughs> it's like, no offense, Anna, 
you know, the, the, the difference between British pep, pep speeches before a soccer game and American pep speech. Our, our coach in, in, in college used to just mock American coaches who would give a pep speech before the game. Our coach would say, okay, guys, lads. He'd say, okay, lads, well, go out there, knock it around, and let's see what happens. <laughs> we were like, yeah. <laughs> knock it around and see what happens. <laughs> oh, man. So maybe Moses was British. <laughs> he says, For I know that after my death you are sure to become utterly corrupt and to turn from the way I've commanded you. In days to come, disaster will fall upon you because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord and provoke him to anger by what your hands have made. So this is something that we own as Christians. God's people from the beginning, from Adam, have been prone to rebellion. And so we as Christians have to realize that we have to have a firm grip of this potential is within us. One of the greatest reliefs for me when I went to seminary down in Orlando was finally some good theology about who we are. And it was this theology about we are people with sin natures and we can do great evil. And we can pursue temptations. Um, and that's something we have to not uh, poo-poo um, but, or, or revel in, but something we have to be aware of. And so that's something we have to be aware of as Christians. This is us here, described. When, when God says this to Solomon, if you do this, and then if the people do this, then I'll, then I'll discipline you. This is God speaking to us as Christians, too. Um, so, F. Um, fading away from God, not only is something often seen in Scripture, and we all have people in our lives where we've seen this, right? You know, a, a brother or a son or even a parent or a good friend or people we used to be in church with, and now they're not in the church and they don't give a flip about God, okay? Uh, it's something that's often seen. F, it can happen later. It can happen later to those strong in faith now. And that's what this writer is, is, is saying. You know, here are these people who are strong in faith. They've just built the temple. They're rejoicing over it. This is a period of great uh, strength in Israel of faithfulness and faith. They've built this temple. This is the high point the high point of Israel's faithfulness right now. All the nations are afraid of them. Wisest king ever, wiser than David. The temple's built. They're rejoicing over it. They've just sacrificed thousands of animals to the Lord because they're so happy and rejoicing in God. The high point of Israel's faith is right now. And this is a warning that for anyone who is strong in faith, there's still always that potential of fading away, of fading away. Um, Paul talked about these people in his life. He had travel companions going out and, and sharing the gospel in all these cities from place to place. In Colossians 4.14, um, he says, Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. So Demas is there with him, as Paul writes Colossians, during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. Demas was faithful along Paul's side in AD 60 to 62 as Paul was imprisoned in Rome. And Paul would get out of this imprisonment uh, two years later. But then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in an imprisonment that's occurring about five years later, Paul's in prison a second time in Rome. And Paul writes this as he's about to die. Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me. It wasn't De Demas, you know, had to go take care of his ailing mother. It was Demas loved the world, and so he's abandoned the faith. Uh, to Timothy in 1 Timothy, Paul wrote, Hold on to faith. This is Paul writing to a young pastor, Timothy whom he met in Lystra on his first missionary journey. Timothy had been with Paul most of Paul's remaining life then. Now Timothy was pastoring a church in Ephesus. And Paul tells young Timothy this, Hold on to faith 
and hold on to a good conscience. You know, I hate to tell you this. Sometimes I'm, I'm in the elevator at General Assembly and I hear pastors talk and they don't have good consciences. Not about sins, but about their care for God's people. And, and they've treated their pastoral ministry like it's a job, like it's a career. <laughs> wow, and I, I think about the people in their church. It's not, we're, not, we're not in a business, you know? Could have, so it, th- that's not it. And so Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you got to keep a good conscience. You're, you're a shepherd of God's flock. You're going to give account to him for the things you've taught and the things you've said. You do, you're more accountable than the average Christian because you've been in this role, right? It's more wicked to be a priest than to bring bad incense into him than it is to just to be a disobedient Israelite. And so Timothy says this, uh, Paul says this to Timothy, hold on to faith in a good conscience. That's so important, a good conscience. Don't just say the words. Don't be a professional pastor. Have a good conscience. Love Christ's people. And if you're accused of not loving them, have, be, be able to take an oath before God and say, no, I've loved them and I've prayed for them. And know that Jesus will back you up on that. Okay, Have a good conscience. And then Paul says, some have rejected these, faith and a good conscience, and have so shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. That means Paul had excommunicated them, handed over to Satan, turned away from the kingdom of God, so you no longer even have membership in the church. So, fading from faith can happen to those who are strong in faith. It happened to Paul's companions out there boldly proclaiming the gospel. G, here's the good news. And here's why we're sitting here. Um, but it doesn't have to. Didn't happen to Paul. Didn't happen to David. David died well, even after, you know, like us, sins. But he was faithful and good in repentance. It doesn't have to. And it should be our goal in life to be faithful. It should be our goal in life to be faithful in every phase and in every step. So young people don't believe for a second. You go to college and you step away for a while and then you'll come back in. I worked in campus ministry for eight, nine, ten years. And, and I saw those people who had grown up in the church and had checked out for a while. Wait, this, is, this is the message. Don't check out ever. And if you have a tragedy occur in your life as a Christian adult person, don't check out. That's not the time to check out. That's time to cling to God. Um, 2 Timothy 4, 6. The time has come for my departure, Paul said, for my death. See, Paul reaches the end of his life, and here's what he says. Chapter 4, verse 7 of 2 Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This happens. That's why Arthur's an encouragement to me and Mary. You know, this this happens. This is what's supposed to be the norm for us in the midst of this warning that not all make it. Not all make it. So H, H. The question is, how do we avoid fading How do we avoid fading in our strong faith? You're here on a Sunday morning. You have strong faith. I'm granting that to you, right? You're here. You're in a bowling alley. Okay, you didn't come here because we had a building. Okay, so how do you remain strong in your faith for your life so at the end of your life in your fading breath, you can say, like Paul, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Number one, to remain strong in faith and thereby experience... Now, remember, that's a long intro. Don't fear. (laughs) To remain strong in faith and thereby experiencing God's blessings, which is what's uh, what's teed up here in in 1 Kings 9. Remember, that's your word, remember that God is good to you. That's verse 9. Look there at verse 9. What's the remedy? 
people are walking by on the travel routes in Israel. And they're saying, why is this land desolate? And why are the towns burned? Why are there remnants of a temple? We used to go by, wow, that was imposing. And now it's flattened, burned, not one stone left on another. Why is that the case? And the answer, the people, the pagans know why it's the case. Verse 9, people will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord uh, their God, who brought their fathers out of Egypt and embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. They have forgotten. They have forgotten. They have forsaken the Lord their God. That's the remedy. Uh, That's the remedy, remembering that God is good, that he brought us out of Egypt, so to speak. And so that's, that's your A there. God is good because he brought you out of Egypt. God is good because he brought you out of Egypt. What does this mean for us? Egypt in Solomon's day was a land that meant slavery. Okay, that's Exodus 1 through 11. What does it mean that God brought his people out of Egypt? It means that he brought them out of slavery. Um, number two, slavery for a person today is not to go back to Egypt and be under Pharaoh and to build pyramids, right? Um, Slavery for a person today is a a theme that's picked up in the New Testament. How does the New Testament talk about slavery? It's what Jim read for us from Romans chapter 6, what Jesus talked about in uh, John chapter 8. Jesus Jesus said, "Whoever I tell you the truth, whoever sins is a slave to sin. Um... Slavery for a person today means being subject to, here are your blanks, being subject to Satan and to one's own sin nature. That's slavery today. Being subject to Satan and to your own sin nature. And so number three, when God brought you to faith, when God brought you faith, he brought you out of the land in which you were a slave to your sinful desires. And we read this responsively as our declaration of the gospel last week from Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Paul says to Christians there in Ephesus, what was true of all of us prior to faith? That we were walking around according to our sinful natures, following our sinful desires and the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. So Satan was our Pharaoh. In our sin nature, that was our Slave, those were our slave masters with the, with the whips. And Paul is saying to us, and Scripture says to us there in Ephesians and in Romans, that prior to having God's Spirit, the only thing that we were ever doing, like a slave, is what our master said for us to do. And that's what our sin nature wanted us to do. Now, for a non-believer, sometimes a sin nature says, well, I like the feeling of altruism. And so a non-believer can be altruistic. He can build a house with habitat for humanity. He can be nice to his mother and that kind of thing. But that's because that's what his sin nature is doing. What serves me is feeling good because I'm a good person. I build houses for other people. You know, or what serves me well while being good, good, extra nice to mom because Christmas is a month away. There are all kinds of ulterior motives that we have. And now today, you know, it's just there's a great motivation for me to be a good person. You know, but that's this in nature. Being a good person is not how I can serve other people. And there's a huge difference between that. I don't care what I am, but I want other people to be doing okay. That's what we say from the Spirit of God. How can I serve people? How can I love my neighbor? And, I, you know, we want to be like Jesus. I don't care what people think about me as long as I'm right with the Lord and doing what's right and treating people with kindness and patience and, and, and love. But slavery for a person today means being subject to Satan and one's own sin nature. And so number three, when God brought you faith, he brought you out of that land that you were a slave to your sin nature. And realize this and what's present in this passage here, that second line in number three, Your sins are detrimental to your life. Just know that. Satan, every time he brings you a temptation, is telling you, if you do this, you'll be better off. If you do this, you'll have joy that God would not give you from not doing this. Satan says, if you don't do this, you'll be in pain. 
And then we all know the experience. It's like Charlie Brown and Lucy in the football. Right? The temptation is to think that Lucy's actually going to hold the football there and we're going to be able to kick it. But every time we fall to temptation, we end up flipping around in the air. Ah! Giraffe. Or rats. Okay? And that's it. What a picture of Satan and temptation. That's it. Lucy is Satan. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you know, I wouldn't do that to you again, Charlie Brown. It's always a pro promise. If you follow me into temptation, your life will be better. And it's always a false promise. It's never true. It always brings hardship to us. Your sins are detrimental to your life. So you see that in chapter 6. You know, the nation said to Israel, if you follow our God, your Baal is the rain God. If you establish worship to Baal, he'll bring you rain, and, and then your crops will grow. There were other gods around the other nations, and they all had their areas of specialty, and so God's people hedged their bets. And they brought in other gods from the other nations, and they worshipped them and bowed down and served them. And guess what happens when you have another God alongside the one true God? Guess who wins? The other God. The other God always wins. Uh, 1 Kings 13.34 says this. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the king, the first king in northern Israel. That led, this was the sin that led to its downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth. You know, just a paradigmatic for us today. That, that cr sin leads to our destruction. Sin leads to our destruction. Or at the end of verse 9 here, what's the word? It's what brings disaster on us. Okay, so sin brings disaster on us. Now B, B. He, when God uh, brought you out of Egypt uh, and your slavery to sin, also brought you into the promised land. So God not only brings you out of slavery to sin, now you have the ability to sin, but sin's no longer your master. Get the picture. Think Old Testament Israel. Your, your old master is in Egypt. You don't have to listen. In fact, you can't even hear him because you're in the promised land. And if you start acting like an Egyptian, worshiping Egyptian gods, in the that's just silly. There are no Egyptian slave masters there to whip you anymore. And that's what Paul says in, in, in uh, Romans 6. Consider yourself dead to sin. Consider yourself dead to your old master, Satan, and the sin nature, begging you to follow in temptations. But, but God not only brings us out of our slavery to sin, but he brings us into the promised land. Number one, the promised land in Solomon in Old Testament times practically meant freedom from Egyptian slavery. Being in the promised land meant you weren't a slave, and it meant you were free from Pharaoh's dominance over your life. Number two, today, the promised land God brings his people into is the church. The church, 2A. The church is the place of freedom from slavery to sin and from freedom from the dominance of Satan over you. And B, this freedom and lack of dominion of Satan and your sin nature is God's goodness to you. So God brings the gospel to you. He brings his spirit to you so you understand the gospel and you become one of his children and you come into the church and becoming one of his children and in the church, you're now part of his kingdom. You're in the promised land on earth today, which is the church, the place where because of God's spirit, we don't have to say yes to our sinful desires. Verse 8. Why has the Lord done, done such a thing to this land and to this temple? Verse 9, because they have forgotten the Lord their God. So we remember that the Lord our God has been good to us. He brought us the gospel. He brought us his spirit. He brought us out of our slavery to sin. And he's brought us into the church where we can enjoy the good fellowship uh, of fellow believers. Now see... See, um, you can remember the Lord the best. You can, so that's a, the, the solution to not fading in your faith is remembering the Lord and that he's good to you. 
how can you do that the best? You can remember the Lord the best and stay faithful and blessed as you stay faithfully in the church. As you stay faithfully in the church. Here's why that makes sense. Number one, outside the church are other gods to serve and worship. Outside the church are other gods to serve and worship. Uh, that's verse six. Why are God's people out, outside now? Because they've uh, gone after other gods that were part of the worship of the nations that surrounded the promised land. What are those other gods? Probably not many of us will be tempted to worship some kind of statue or to physically sacrifice our son to uh, a god like they did in Israel, the god Molech. Um, we're probably not, not going to be tempted to do those uh, that kind of um, worship or go after those kind of gods. But there are other gods, things we bow down to, things we serve and obey on the same level as God. And when something else is on the same level as God, what wins? It's the other thing. It's like in the Catholic Church. What the Pope says and what the Bible says are in their doctrine on equal measure. So when the Bible says, no purgatory, that Paul says, I'll die and I'll immediately be with the Lord. The church says, well, there's purgatory first. And the Bible says, no, there's not. So what do they do? When both things are even, what man says wins. So, I, you know, you talk to a Catholic and they, you can convince them that purgatory is not in the Bible. And they say, yeah, I know, but the church says that purgatory is, and so it is. But the same thing, when something else is an equal, uh, an equal level of loyalty, you get to it or it's something that you value as, as well as you and as much as you value God, that thing will win. What are those things outside uh, the church that are other gods that you can serve and worship? Work. Of course, many people have done that. They've served and worshiped work of and above, God, uh, above, and, above and beyond God. School, pursuing school and studies. Uh, money is a God. Approval of others is a God. Popularity is a God. Success is a God is a God. Travel can be a God. Sleep can be a God. Vacations can be a God. Sunday morning sports can be a God. Sports in general can be a God. Um, there are all these things that we can do, none of which are sins. It's okay to, to work. Of course, it's okay to have money. It's okay if other people approve of you. Uh, if you're being faithful to the Lord, it's okay to have success. It's okay to have a vacation. It's okay to sleep. But these things, though they're not sinful in, in and of themselves, can become things we serve and worship above God. And here's the litmus test. If any of those things and something God has told you to do conflict, which do you obey? Okay. Um, you know, if, if you've got some... Um, you know, I'll pick on myself. I was in sports. If you got something in, in sports on Sunday morning, which you obey. Um, if you've got uh, lots of studying to do, I love school. I was in school. I don't read anymore because I was exhausted in school from all my reading. Now I read to prepare. But you know what? Boy, I really got a tough exam. Who's going to be my God? Am I going to be at worship, or am I going to use these three hours to study? Um, work, same thing. Am I going to be at worship or am I going to use these three hours to, to work? Or if I work so hard Saturday night and through the night that I can't attend worship, what's our God? Uh, sleep or God? Um, all, kind, all these kinds of things. What if my friends don't approve of me being a Christian or going to church? Am I going to, to deny that's where I was yesterday when I'm sitting there Monday at lunch? What's my God? Popularity? Approval of others or God? Um, what is it we're bowing down to? What is it we're serving? You know, in Scripture, the word worship and serve are the same word. It's the same Hebrew word, and so translators have to decide, do I translate this serve or worship? And you can see it in, in the English uh, of Scripture. You know, worship and ser serve. You went, out, you went away after other gods and served them it could be translated worship. It's the same thing. That's why we have a service of worship. A service is our worship of God.
So there are other things outside the church that are God's we can serve and worship. Verse 6, back in context, this passage, what leads you to no want, to having your faith fade and experiencing the discipline of God? Those things that we serve above God. Those things that have a higher place in our hearts and our minds above God. Number two, inside the church, inside the church, you have God's word, the Bible, to guide you, and his spirit to empower you to do so. So 2 Timothy 4.2, um, we looked at uh, Paul's words this morning. It's your preparing for the hearing of God's word. Paul says to Timothy, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct and rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. The church is the place where God's word is preached in season and out of season. Uh, it's the place where God's uh, spirit is. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't mean we don't leave the church building. It doesn't mean we don't get a job outside the church. Uh, but it does mean we need the church to remain faithful. Um, Three, the key to faithfulness and continuance in life uh, and being blessed and satisfying is remembering the Lord. In the church, God is remembered. His word is declared. His word is preached. We're around other people who believe it, and that causes us to remember the Lord too. In the church, God is remembered, and being inside the church gets God in your face at least once a week. And we need that. We need that so that our faith, which is strong today, isn't like that that hair dye that kind of washes out and needs to be renewed after two weeks. Church gets God in your face every week, week after week, so that we do not forget him. And along with this, your regular presence in the church is number two. Number two, our our last little point. To remain strong in the faith, keep fixing your eyes on your faithful king, Jesus. To remain strong in the faith, keep fixing your eyes on your faithful king, Jesus. Um, Hebrews 4 and 5 talk about the importance first of Solomon and his sons being faithful. And then almost imperceivably, it talks about the people being unfaithful if the king is unfaithful. This is one of those examples where we see the way the king goes is the way the people goes. Go. If the king goes unfaithful, the people will be unfaithful. If the king is faithful, the people will be faithful. If the king's unfaithful, the people will be unfaithful. And so God really slips from those first two verses talking to Solomon about being having integrity of heart and uprightness and you'll always have a king on the throne, to that plural, if you or your sons turn away from me, and so still talking about the king, but then quickly, it's infected the people. Okay, it's infected the people. So, in Old Testament, in the Old Testament times, they had a disadvantage, because their king sometimes was faithful, like David or Solomon or Hezekiah or Josiah, but many times their king was unfaithful. Many times their king was unfaithful, and so went they. But the advantage we have as New Testament believers is we have Jesus as our king. We will never have an unfaithful king. And so just as Old Testament Israelites were to fix their eyes on David, or to fix their eyes on Solomon, or fix their eyes on Josiah, who said, hey, everybody, let's gather together. Let's give our special gift to rebuild the temple and to restore it so that we can start worshiping again. And hear me now, gather together, and let's read God's word together. Josiah does this. And the people were to fix their eyes on the son of David, who would lead them in faithfulness. That was a job. That was part of the job description of the king in Israel. But in the Old Testament, they could have unfaithful kings and then they would be unfaithful, and then they would be exiled. But our advantage is that our King, Jesus, not only did he never sin in his time on earth, but he is faithful to us today as he reigns over us as our King from the heavenly Jerusalem on the right side of the Father, right Sunday school class. Uh, We look to our capital city, Jerusalem, and to our King who reigns from our capital city to heavenly Jerusalem, 
And so that's why Hebrews chapter two, 12, verse 2, that Jim read for us, says this. Let us, and this is the writer of Hebrews, telling us how we can be faithful, like Old Testament saints he had just talked about in Hebrews 11, like Moses, like Noah, like, like Abraham. How can we be faithful? How can we make it to the end being faithful, not having our faith in him fade? He says, Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How did Jesus make it? And through, through a life of faithfulness to the right hand of God, through his faithfulness, and now we're told to follow his example. We fix our eyes on him. And this imperceptible, as we see here between verses 4 and 5, into verses 6 through 9, this imperceptible uh, 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 connection between us and our king strengthens us. Because as we are connected to our king, as we're focusing our eyes on Jesus, as we're saying, how would Jesus treat this person? What would Jesus say to this? What would Jesus have me say to this person? How was Jesus when he was persecuted for saying he was the son of God? How did he respond? Did he shrink back? And we say, no, he didn't, so neither will I. Because I've fixed my eyes on my king. And my, when my king was asked, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? He said, I am. And so when people say to us, do you think Jesus is the son of God? We say, I do. And if that leads us to being crucified socially, probably is the case for us. In other countries, it's physically. We say, I do believe that. Do you believe Jesus is the only way to God? I do. Because Jesus was the good testifier of his faith, of his belief of what was true. And so we are, and so we are as well. So we fix our eyes on our faithful king, Jesus. So that's your A and B here. 2A, our king Jesus is faithful. And as you fix your eyes on him and his example, you too can be faithful and continue to experience God's blessings. And then B, and you can learn of your king and fix your eyes upon him in the church. How do you know? How do you fix your eyes on Jesus? By reading the scriptures and by having the scriptures taught to you. That tells you who Jesus is so you can be like him in your life and that will be, mean for you a life of faithfulness where your faith does not fade and you don't wind up outside the church in terrible shape at any point in your life spiritually. So conclusion, bringing this all together now, faithfulness, that's your word, faithfulness, not serving other gods throughout your life. Faithfulness throughout your life without skips is your goal and brings you blessing. To achieve this, you need to, two things, remember God and his goodness to you. None of your friends, uh, no bosses you'll ever have, freed you from slavery to sin. None of your bosses, no, no person there, friend who's potentially going to persecute you, is going to bring you into heaven. They're not going to be that good to you. But your God has been that good to you. So remember your God and remember his goodness to you. And to do this, number two, fix your eyes on Jesus, learning of him and looking to him as your example. Fix your eyes on Jesus, your faithful king, looking to him as your example for how you live life. And then lastly, tying those two together, both of these things, both of these things are in the church. The church is designed to help you do both of these. To help you to help you see each week in your face, God is good, God is good, God is good. And here's what Jesus is like so you can fix your eyes upon him. And by that, that's God's prescription for us. Every week, I, I had a friend in seminary, uh, uh, Mark, um, Mark and Cheryl, Holly, from Gallipolis, which is near where Dave and, and uh, uh, Ohio, we always said Gallipolis, he said Gallipolis, so it's Gallipolis. But he said, you know my preaching, I don't expect anyone to remember what I preached three days from then. I don't. 
And I don't. If you talk to me about a sermon on Tuesday afternoon, I'm like, what are you talking about? And you have to tell me. And I say, oh, yeah, 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 I, re I remember that. But if they don't eat it every week, it's like not, not eating food. Pretty soon you're weak. And pretty soon you're compromising yourself to get food and doing things you ought not to do. It's just maintenance for your soul to be in the church week after week, to be reminded that God is good, and to be, re be told what Jesus is like so you can fix your eyes upon him. This is to your spiritual health so you never find yourself having shipwrecked your faith. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your, the means you have appointed for the preservation and endurance of our faith and faithfulness in our lives. We pray that you would cause us to avail ourselves to it, that you would bring us into this place week after week, that we can fix our eyes upon your Son as he is taught and proclaimed, and so that we can be refreshed in our remembrance that you are good and that you, Lord, are God and there is no other. That you are the God who has delivered us from the slavery of just doing what our sin nature, our evil uh, desires wanted to do. You have freed us from that. You have brought us into the promised land of the church. You will bring us into the promised land of heaven and into the promised land of the new heavens and new earth. So cause us to take hold of those means you've appointed for us in the church, that we would always be a source of a person that you could look down upon like you looked down upon Job and say, have you considered my servant and name our name for our good and for your glory. We pray this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Let's now uh, stand together and, and sing of God's strengthening of us as we sing a mighty fortress is our God. the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Please meet and greet one another in Christ's love.
Glad you could join us uh, this morning. Uh, we'll broadcast again and, and uh, get it up in the afternoon next week as well. Thanks. Glad you could be here. <laughs>